Welcome to the HerbWorks Podcast featuring Roger Drummer, the formulator at HerbWorks.com. An educator in the field of nutrition and Chinese herbalism, Roger has a unique ability to keep things simple by taking all the guesswork out of complicated health issues. HerbWorks is committed to helping you improve your health and enhance your life through herbs and common sense. Hello and welcome to the Herb Works Podcast. I'm Laura Shakti. And Roger Drummer. Hello everyone. Today we are talking about, we have an introduction to the energetics of herbs and food. That's kind of a big title. You want to break down for me, Mr. Drummer, what we're going to talk about? Well, just in general, what is the energetic properties of the food that you eat and the herbs that you take and why is it important to anybody and maybe nutrition versus energetics because it's a... It's completely different. Okay, so the nutrition of food versus the energetic property of food are two very different things. Two very different things. Okay, so I think originally you had some very strange title for this podcast, knowing you. I was going to call it Muck Luck the Fruitarian Eskimo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is a story behind that. Do you want to tell that now? Well, or real we quick, later? think about it. An Eskimo lives up in the freezing Arctic, cold yeah. and Mukluk, which just a made up name, but a fruitarian Eskimo. Think about someone who can only eat fruit because he's restricted his diet and he's eating the one food that will make him feel like he's freezing all the time because the energetics of fruit are very cooling or cold and it's completely the wrong food for an Eskimo to be eating. <laughs> I see. Okay, so... So the joke was that Mukluk was always going into the igloo store to buy b frozen blueberries <laughs> <laughs> or looking for peaches. And besides the fact there was never any around, if he did try to live off that, he'd freeze to death. So. Okay, so maybe if you live in the Arctic, ha having a fruitarian diet is not the best option. Let's talk about why. First of all, let me ask you this. What is the the knowledge basis that we're talking about? Where are you pulling this knowledge from about the energetics of food? And of course, herbs are a food. Right. And it's all from my training in Chinese herbology. And I didn't know anything about this when I started my apprenticeship and becoming an herbalist. But I just had so many unbelievable examples of, of how it works with food. And besides that, all herbs are classified in Chinese herbology. You know, you heard the term yin and yang. Mm -hmm. Well, another way of saying that is hot and cold. And one of the underlying basis of all Chinese herbology and all formulation is the fact that you're taking a formula and matching it up to a human being and you're deciding what condition that human being has and whether it involves being cold or hot or a localized heat condition and you're giving them an herb product to balance it out. Let's say, let's say I had chronic fatigue, right? And I was cold all the time, but I was also what they call yin deficient. So I would get hot once in a while, but I was mostly cold. So when I would, you mean you were mostly cold? You mean you had... I felt cold most of the time. Even in the summer, if I walked into the shade, I would get chills. Right. We all know people like that. Some people say, oh, well, they're just too skinny or they don't have enough body fat or... No, it has to do with an, more with an internal energy. And so I was taking Chinese herbs that were more warming in nature, but couldn't take extremely hot ones because I was so worn out, it would cause me to be further in balance. So I was kind of the guy that needed the warming formulas that were restorative. That was my niche in Chinese herbology, and that's how I used herbs to get out of my chronic fatigue. So we have both studied traditional Chinese medicine and this idea of yin and yang and hot and cold in the body. But can you explain a little bit more what you're talking about? Because I even kind of lost you in that story a little bit about being cold, but taking hot herbs versus cold herbs. I think maybe we need to back up and go to what makes something hot or cold and in its effect upon your body. What's well, the energetic effect? And again, you know, the Chinese classify all their herbs according to yin and yang. Okay. And there's a large 
spectrum that runs from very cold substances all the way up to very hot substances. Now, in my particular case, my adrenals were worn out. I was really stressed out. I had all these imbalances in my body, but most of them manifested in feeling cold all the time, lethargic, low energy. And so I wanted to build my energy up, but I couldn't take uh, any cooling restorative herbs because when you restore your kidney, what they call kidney adrenal or Jing energy in Chinese herbology, you can take herbs that are really restorative that are cold and cooling or th some that are slightly warm. I did better with a little combination of both, but so that the formula was slightly warming because I needed to warm up a bit. So, I know it sounds confusing, but when you're in an herb shop and you got a choice of 400 different things, you can easily match up things. <laughs> and that's you really are what the a, mix, that, and, mix and match. That's guy. really what a Chinese herbologist does. When you go to see somebody, they take their pulse. They're matching up that herb to your particular constitution and your particular condition. Right, like an Ayurvedic medicine and traditional Chinese it's medicine. It's similar. Yeah. It's similar. So can you explain a little bit about, just for in general, different foods can make you feel hot or cold. If you're a fruitarian, let's go back to, to the Eskimo example. The muck if you are eating a very cold diet of frozen things or fruit, how is that affecting you internally? It could be cooling off your digestive fire. And so you have to match up your food intake with your own metabolism and your environment. And here's a really great example of that. Let's say it's wintertime. Let's say you live in Ohio and it's the middle of winter. You obviously aren't really craving salads a whole lot. Because it's cold outside. You want to warm up. So people feel better when they're eating a warm meal. They sit down to a warm field. It adds a little body warmth to their system. Whereas opposed, if you're someone living in that same environment in the winter and you've been reading so much about health that you think you're supposed to eat salads all day and drink juice, well, both of those things are very cold energetically. And you could end up being cold all the time in your environment because your body's not going to make any heat out of it and the food itself is very cooling and detoxifying. But that same diet, if you flipped it into the summer when you're when it's hot outside, like we live in Nevada and you know it's going to be 110 here for a good portion of the summer, that's a great climate to do a little bit of juicing, have some extra fruit, eat salads with dinner because it's very cooling and it helps your body to deal with heat and breaking things down and moving them out of your body. So most people may be familiar, let's say at the, you know, a base level of if you drink peppermint tea, it cools you down. You have a, a feeling of being cooler. So it's great to drink peppermint tea in the summer. If you drink ginger tea, it warms you up, right? If you drink ginger tea, you feel a little warmer, your digestion gets a little warmer, you may become a little bit more flush. So ginger tea is a great thing to drink in the winter. Well, ginger is an herb that's very warming. In fact, it's considered to be hot. Mm -hmm. And it's used in herbology for excessive moisture in your digestion. So let's say you're someone who feels kind of cold all the time. You eat way too much fruit and you tend to drink too many sugary drinks, so your body holds on to moisture too much. And so you could take ginger, and it would warm up your digestion and move water. It's a water-moving herb, and it warms up your digestion. And so that in response to peppermint? In response to peppermint, completely different energetic effect. Okay, so this is a very base level where we can look at simply things that people have in their kitchen, right? They probably have powdered ginger, they probably have peppermint tea or some kind of mint. So that's a very basic example of well, here's a, a food that Here's warms another you one. There's a lot of people eat garlic. Everybody right. knows garlic's a healthy thing to eat and a lot of people like it. But garlic itself is very warming also. So sometimes if you're somebody that gets angry a lot, you know, that's kind of considered to be almost a expression of heat, anger, you get flushed. You probably don't want to eat a lot of garlic because it makes you warm and it might 
make make it easier for you to express your anger. You just have to see how you react to that particular food. I don't do well on garlic. My liver doesn't react well to it. Well, what about the healing properties of garlic in the sense that it is a blood purifier? It's very good for you nutritionally. Um, it's one of the recommended triune foods in you know yogic uh, cooking when you have ginger, garlic, onion, turmeric. Like th- this is something that we use quite often in cooking. All right. Well, you'll probably be surprised to hear this, but I don't care. <laughs> if something doesn't make you feel good, then it doesn't matter if it's listed as one of the most nutritious things in the world. It doesn't make me feel good. So why would I eat it? I'm not going to eat something. Good thing you're not supposed- opinionated at all. Supposedly it's good for me, but I feel terrible on it. Mm, oh, I and see. that this is one thing a lot of people miss is that they'll they'll take things because the literature on it is so amazing but they don't match up with that particular food and they get health problems from it. And then they think there's something wrong with them because it's such an amazing food. And I'll tell you one of the things that, that I've had a lot of experience with that cause people to have problems. And yet it's listed as one of the most nutritious things in the world. And what's that? Spirulina. Spirulina. Spirulina is a blue green algae. Mm -hmm. And, you know, depending on the literature you want to read, they even brag that it could become the number one protein source in the entire world. You could eat so much of it and get all your protein needs out of spirulina. I almost gag when I hear that. (laughs) You know, besides the fact that spirulina tastes horrible to me, I don't energetically vibe with that particular substance. And if I eat too much of it, it just makes me really cold and it gives me loose bowels, right? So why would I want to consume it as a protein source? And here's here's the problem. I've had many clients who find out spirulina is really good for them. And instead of taking one or two capsules a day, which makes it a nice nutritional supplement, they'll take 16 to 20 of them a day, thinking it's so good for them. And then mm. three weeks later, I'm talking to them about a new health problem they have. They're bloated all the time. They, their body's holding on to water weight, mm. and it's all because they're taking too much of a nutritional supplement that's good in small amounts. Uh, they're now taking a large amount, and it's caused their body to have an imbalance. And this happens a lot in the nutritional world, a lot more than you would think, that people find some food or some powdered drink that they think is so amazing for them, and yet it doesn't match up with their body just doesn't handle it well energetically. And so they begin to think there's something wrong with them because that thing is so good and I'm feeling so bad (laughs) that there must be something wrong with me. But the reality is, is that the food is pointing out that maybe your digestion's a little bit cold and you don't match up with that food. So maybe you should quit doing that, build your digestion, add some warming herbs like ginger, cinnamon, and that stuff to your diet, and eat some food that are in a different form, maybe steamed vegetables. Okay, so I I hear you kind of talking about two different themes then. One is there is this categorization of food, herbs included, where ginger is a warming food, it makes you very warm. Peppermint is maybe on the opposite scale of that, that can cool you down. And food can do the same thing, whether it's lamb, chicken, seafood, soybeans, lentils, kind of going from very concentrated, let's say, proteins, right, animal source proteins, versus vegetarian sourced proteins, that that there's a category that's already been established through traditional medicines that list whether those foods are warm or not. And then there's also how it affects you personally on a personal level due to your what? What is what is your own constitution. You know, certain people are are kind of sluggish, you know, they're maybe they put on water weight easily. Other people are very thin, maybe they're robust, they have a red reddish complexion, they're hot, they so run So you're talking hot about metabolism. Time. Metabolism is different. And body type. And it's, you know, and the food is not that confusing to figure out. All, and within every food group, there's variances. But if, as long as you know the generalities of it, fruit in general is always very cold mm-hmm. or cold. Mm-hmm. So 
in traditional medicine, such as um, Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine, in addition to this categorization of food as warming or cooling, they there are body types, you know, in Ayurvedic medicine and whatnot. Kind of what you're talking about this uh, metabolism based. Uh, reaction to the food itself. Well, Chinese medicine doesn't do the body type so much. They're right. more organ-based um, medicine. But they do look at matching up foods and how they put foods together. In fact, every culture around the world has herbs and different things they add to their traditional foods mm -hmm. to balance the energetics of it, as opposed to here in America, we mostly just eat what we like to right. eat. Give me an example it. of an ethnic dish that has balancing herbs put in it to balance out the effects of whatever the main part of that meal is. Well, you look at a lot of Indian food is vegetarian. Vegetarian food in general is cooling to your digestive system. They use a lot of curries, a lot of things like turmeric and ginger mm. and garlic and mm. things that are warming to the food. So it actually helps boost your metabolism a little bit and keeps it from getting a little bit bogged down from the extra amount of moisture and cooling effect of the food that you're eating. Mm -hmm. What about Italian food? Pasta, I'm thinking pasta with, you know, basil and garlic. Well, they don't so much, you know, balance their meals out with herbs, but they do use a lot of lemon, mm. a lot of garlic, a lot of... Sometimes you know, spicy peppers. Basil, yeah. rosemary, all mm. those things are slightly spicy and a little bit warming. Hmm. Okay. So can you give me a personal example of when you experimented on yourself? Because I know you are the great experimenter. Well, this um, is what triggered my, uh, my look into energetics of food. And then I want to go over the whole spectrum so everybody understands it. But when I had chronic fatigue and I was living in the Venice Beach area, someone took me out to eat at a Thai restaurant. And I was cold all the time, yet I was what they called deficient. I was burned out. You know, when mm. you're burned out, you're pretty much deficient. You have to build your entire system up, right? Okay. It's a balance between yin and yang, and you're always So you were deficient with, in digestive energy. You were deficient, I was deficient in, in... Digestion, in kidney adrenal energy. I was stressed out. Okay. And so we were at this restaurant, and they convinced me to try a little bit of lamb in my curry. And I didn't eat meat at the time. I was vegetarian, but I was willing to try a little bit of it because I was so fatigued. Mm -hmm. And it tasted good, but I immediately felt like I was going to spontaneously combust. <laughs> I did Literally, you? <laughs> I was so hot. I, I, I was thinking of running out of the restaurant. I was so hot. And so... Luckily for me, somebody at my table had ordered ice cream. And you know how in the Thai restaurants, they bring you ice cream, just one perfectly round yeah, yeah. scoop. I just grabbed their cup, threw the whole scoop <laughs> in my mouth and swallowed it without even biting the entire thing. And within about two minutes, I just felt like someone poured ice water on the top of my head. It just felt so good. But then I started paying attention to at work because I was apprenticing in a store, more about the energetics of food. And it turns out lamb of all the meats, is the most warming meat that you could ever consume. And here I had it in a curry, which had warming herbs in mm. it. And I was deficient, which means I was sensitive to the imbalances of herbs and spices. So I, had to, I was always playing with my program to get the right balance. And that was an extreme off the charts and hot food that I ate. The lamb hot flash. The lamb hot flash is what it was. Now, most people think about that in relation to eating chili. I mean, we've lived in New Mexico, and we know what happens when you eat some really hot chili. People are, you know, sweating and feeling like they're going to die and com combust. And, uh, well, reaching... hot things can cool you off after a period of time, even mm. after the initial heat, because it causes you to sweat, and that's how your body, mm. you know, releases heat. But that started me on this whole process of learning about foods. And, and it can get very confusing, but not if you just stick to basics. And the basics are all fruit is either very cold or cooling. There are some slightly warm fruits, but even those are cooling, right? Mm. All vegetables are slightly cooling up to maybe neutral, but they're all still a little bit warmer than fruit. Right. And then you get into that middle zone where you're into neutral things. Mm. 
-hmm. which can be some grains, some beans, a few protein foods. They fall just a little bit on either side of the the neutral zone, slightly warming, a little bit warming foods. And what about root vegetables like beets, carrots, onions, garlic? They're still cooling, although they can have, well, garlic's not a vegetable, it's more of an herb. That's warming, right? But in general, most of these things are, you know, vegetables are going to be cooling up to maybe neutral. And you can make them warm a little bit by the way that you prepare them. If you steam carrots, they're not as cooling and detoxifying. They become more neutral in their effect on your system. Stir frying something makes it more neutral than having it raw. Anything that's consumed raw will be more cooling and detoxifying to your body than something that's actually steamed or stir-fried and prepared. Okay, So so you change things slightly by preparation, and so you kind of match that up with your own energy and with the seasons. Now you get into meats, and lamb is way out there on the the hot. (laughs) Obviously, the hot flash area. The hot end, you know. (laughs) So if you're going through menopause, you probably don't want to be eating lamb, (laughs) right? Um, chicken's a little warming and invigorating. Uh, beef is more just slightly warm, maybe neutral. It's not as, um, it's not going to have this huge heating effect on your system. In fact, they consider beef to be slightly sedating to your liver. Interesting. And what about the pescatarians amongst us? Uh, fish, most fish is slightly cooling to neutral to maybe slightly warming, unless you're going to look at something like uh, salmon. Wild salmon's probably the most invigorating fish that you can have, and it's slightly warm. Right. So this is really actually a very broad topic, looking it's at a broad how, topic. how food has been categorized into cooling to neutral foods for the human body versus foods that heat up the human body. And mostly what you've talked about is kind of looking at natural plant-based foods, roots, leaves, Fruits, which is what a plant is composed of, right? Root right. vegetables, leaf vegetables, such as, you know, broccoli and celery, and then fruits versus animal protein, um, which is more on the heating side. How, how could people find more information on this if they wanted to? Because it's a very big subject. Well, there's not that many books out. There was a great book out. I don't know if it's still on the market. You can probably maybe find it at Abe's Books if it's not currently on Amazon. But it was called Healing with Whole Foods. Oh, that's been around for a while, yeah. By Paul Pitchford. And that covers energetics pretty well. Uh, You have to remember, though, I think he is a raw food guy. So Mm. it's going to be slanted toward the benefits of raw food. And you are not a raw, raw food guy. No, I love raw food, but I'm no longer addicted to that. Addicted to it? Why would you be addicted to it? Raw foods are very addicting. How? Because you don't get into raw foods unless you think it's for a major health concern. Generally, you're doing it because you think and you've accepted the belief that it's the greatest diet and the greatest thing you could ever do for yourself. So when you start having health problems from it, it's really hard to change. Because now you start thinking, like I said earlier, that there's something wrong with you because you're not reacting to raw foods that well. And sometimes they're just not the right food for you at this particular moment. And here's a, here's a great example of that. When I, um, I did the Fit for Life diet once, it was part of how I you know, lost some weight, how I um, balanced my system. I went from being a Midwest guy who grew up on mashed potatoes, gravy, and chicken. Mm. You know, and meat and that mm. type of And eating. your mother's really good nettles and dumplings and homemade. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I grew up on. And then to balance that out, when I got on the fit for life diet, which means you eat 10 pieces of fruit before noon, before you get into anything else, and then you eat more fruit and you're eating vegetables and salads all the time. That was a great diet for about a month because <laughs> my body, it broke down all in detox from all this other food that I'd been eating for 20 years. Mm. Right. But at a certain point, your body no longer requires detoxing and breaking down. That's what that type of diet is good for. It breaks things down, moves it out of your system, you know, detoxifies your colon. All these things are going on, and it's great. But for some people, especially me, after a while, I no longer needed that. I needed to build my system up, and that diet doesn't build you up. 
you need more protein foods, more warming foods, more things that are in a balance. So I needed to come off of that raw food diet, move back toward the middle, and have some raw, some cooked, more proteins, more of a balanced meal, which is where everybody falls, really. Hmm. So when you when you look at, and this is the, you know, it didn't just happen to me. This happens to most people. When you're looking at your diet, just because something makes you feel really good and gives you a big jump in your health, that doesn't mean that six weeks from now, eight weeks from now, that that's going to be perfect for you. Your body will adjust to it. And maybe because you had an extreme one way, you needed an extreme the other way to bring you back to the middle. Everybody does better in the middle. And I love raw food, but I don't want to have more than half of my diet be raw food as mm. far as bulk. I love some proteins, too, and I feel better on a good piece of protein a couple times a day and more warming food. But you know what? Summer's coming in Nevada, so I'm going to be mm. eating a lot of salads <laughs> and eating that type of food. And this is really more your common sense approach to all of the information that is out in the health world, the health food world, this is really what you do. I mean, you kind of, you sift through a lot of medical research, you experiment on yourself, you've had a lot of time to do these different diets and different foods, you've gone through different health issues. And so what I, what I hear you saying is that, I mean, that makes a lot of common sense to me that, you know, if you want to eat one way or another, you should look at how it actually affects your body where you are in life today versus just thinking, well, this diet is fabulous and that diet has, you know, the most hype on it. And this one was used by my friend and she lost 17 pounds, whatever it is. It's true. You have to match it up to your own lifestyle and not be afraid to change once you find out that you're not thriving on something anymore. Uh, and that's why I said the raw food diet was so addictive. Well, one part of that is because you eat that much fruit, it's a lot of sugar, and mm. you get addicted to sugar. And you've talked about sugar before. And the other thing is that you just, it, mentally, you think there's something wrong with you because this perfect diet that is the perfect food makes you feel terrible. Mm. And so there's something wrong with you. That's what you think. And it's generally, it's not mm. true. You just... You have an imbalance that you need to figure out and get some help with maybe and figure that out and find a different diet that you can try. Mm -hmm. But when you have this general idea about how foods affect you, it might be easier for you to figure this out. And this is what makes it different than nutrition. Let's say like bananas. Everybody knows bananas are amazing for you, right? Calcium, magnesium, I don't know if they have potassium. Is it potassium? It's yeah, potassium. Potassium. Mm -hmm. potassium. So bananas are this amazing food, right? But they make me sick. So is it an amazing food for me? If I eat bananas, and I absolutely love bananas, I love the taste of a banana, but if I eat them, I'll get a migraine. Mm -hmm. So is that a good food for me? Right. And it might have to do with the energetics because bananas are very cooling and detoxifying. Uh, it might just do with some other. You might little, just be allergic to it. Some little other allergy, but a day or so after I eat a banana, I'll get a really bad headache. So I don't consume them anymore, and it's worse as they start to ripen up. Hmm. And this happens with a lot of people that might get headaches. You know, certain types of cheeses, ripened fruit, all right, have this effect migraine. on your system. Yeah. So you just don't eat it, and then you go, "Well, it's so nutritious." Well, so what? There's a million things you can eat, <laughs> and they're right. all nutritious. So, so there's this idea of breaking down food by its constituents, how much potassium it has, how much magnesium it has, how much vitamin C it has. And then there's this idea of looking at food, herbs included, as something that has a specific effect upon your body. It might warm you up. It might cool you down. You use this as an herbologist in your formulas, right? I do. And, well, that's how you're trained. Chinese herbology is all about how you match things up. Now, mm. because I don't personally sit down and do pulse readings and diagnose individuals, what I do is sell mass market formulas that anybody can take. I have to sit down and formulate that in a way that anybody can take it 
Mm-hmm. Let's say I'm I'm always shooting for ninety five percent, right? Mm-hmm. Anybody can take it without becoming imbalanced because of the way the formula is put together energetically. And when meaning you do, the formula is more neutral versus heating or cooling, it's slightly warm because everybody does better on slightly warm because most of my formulas are based on adaptogenic herbs. Mm-hmm. Adaptogens run the part of your body which runs homeostasis. Mm. So it regulates your temperature anyway. This is how they discovered adaptogens. They took a luthero ginseng and gave it to uh, 2,000 people. I think it was 2,000 people in Siberia that were freezing all the time. Hmm. And they warmed up. And they gave the same herb in the same dose to a couple thousand people that were too hot all the time, and they cooled off. Same exact herb, uh. same dose. Why is that? Because it feeds the part of your glandular system that regulates homeostasis. Interesting. And so my formulas, my main two formulas, are based on adaptogenic herbs, but they're also slightly warm and regulating. So that type of formula can go out, and I can feel safe to anybody taking it without throwing their them into an imbalance of yin or yang or hot or cold or whatever it is. And so that's different than most people that formulate things that don't that aren't aware of this that just throw a bunch of stuff together that's all good for you. Right. So that's the difference between your formulas, Tian Chi, Inner Peace, that they're they're made from this perspective of adaptogenic herbs and treating the body as a holistic system right. versus breaking down the chemical components of something nutritionally and saying, well, X, Y, and Z is good for you, so I'm going to put X, Y, and Z together. Whereas you might look at that same X, Y, and Z and go, you know, X and Z, when they're together, have this specific effect. But if I put Y in, it changes everything. Right. And so this is okay nutrition-wise when you're making like a multivitamin. You Mm. want to add a lot of nutrition. Right, but it's a whole different world in neurology. As far as eating, I've given up on the whole thing of worrying about what food has what nutrition in it, whether it has a lot of magnesium, whether it has a lot of potassium. I mean, I, I know these general concepts, but I don't think of food in those terms of this has the most of that nutrient and this, that. I just eat a lot of whole foods. Mm. A broad range of whole foods. And you know, when I had cancer is when I gave up the whole nutritional thing. You, you, this sounds funny because most people, when they get a cancer program, they go, well, you got to eat all raw food. You got to do all this detox. You gotta, everything has to be juiced and all this. Detox, detox, detox. Yeah, and right? I just didn't think that that's what I needed. So when I went on the ketogenic diet, that is all about regulating your blood sugar. So I decided I'm shooting for a number. I'm going to regulate my blood sugar, starve my cancer to death. I don't care about the nutritional content of my food. But taking that into effect, I also was still eating really nutritious food. Even with that concept in mind, I was eating 6 to 10 servings of green vegetables a day. So when you say, I don't care about the nutritional effect of my food. What you mean is I wasn't going you weren't to care obsessed if I was, about I wasn't obsessed it. with everything being perfect, and I wasn't obsessed with juicing it as opposed to Eating steaming it. it slightly or sauteing it a little bit to make it a little warmer to go with my meal. I had it in regard, sure, I pick all these foods because I love eating nutritious food, but I got out of the concept of thinking I had to have the perfect form and the perfect amount as opposed to what balanced out my plate so that I had to the best blood sugar, because at a certain point in the ketogenic diet, the theory is for cancer that you're going to starve it to death. And so by eating a diet that regulated my sugar and raised my ketones, I was in a zone, which I just called the dead zone, (laughs) because my cancer was going to be dead. And it worked. But I still eat really nutritious food. And I eat a lot of greens and a lot of whole foods that I buy and prepare. So this is a very interesting concept, probably for most people, the idea of the energetics of what they're eating versus the nutritional breakdown or the chemical component of their food. What's the most important thing that you would want our listeners to go away with from this conversation? Well, I want to broaden their awareness that say about how they think about food. 
don't just think about looking up what's the food with the most potassium or what's the food with this. You know, mm-hmm. those things are important, but what is in season? You know how they talk about eating foods that are in season? Seasonally, yeah. Most foods that are in season match up with the energetics of that time of the year. Like in spring, you get a lot of green, new green things that are detoxifying mm-hmm. and Asparagus. cooling. Asparagus. Cooling to detoxify and cool you down from the concentrated, baked, and and heartier foods you ate all winter. And the summer comes along. What do you have there? You have a lot of green, leafy things available. Fruits. You have a lot more fruit available, which is detoxing and cooling energetically to your system because it's hot outside. And then as fall comes along, what's available? More squashes. root vegetables, mm-hmm. squashes that are more warming and condensed that you bake and warm them up a little bit more. And then throughout the whole year, you do have proteins, which are always warming, but you eat smaller amounts at certain times of the year. And you maybe eat a little bit more because it's heavier. And, and it's always natural in most cultures that you put a little weight on in the fall and the winter to get you through the winter. These are all just natural things, and it's all based on the food that's available at that time. And those energetics match up with you in that season where you actually live. So what you're saying is that although most of us who are striving for a more healthy lifestyle think about eating whole foods, think about um, the way we're preparing foods and the way the foods have been sourced, there's a lot of talk about that. But actually looking at eating a more seasonal diet makes sense for us insofar as balancing how our bodies naturally want to adjust to whether we are in 117 degrees in the Nevada summer or whether we're in 17 below in the Ohio winter. Yeah. And so don't fall into the muck luck situation <laughs> looking for blueberries when there's a blizzard out. The reality is, is looking that... Looking for blueberries in a blizzard. Find foods. You know, if you're starting a new diet, find something that makes you feel really good and has a lot of nutritious food in it, a lot of whole foods. If you don't thrive on that after a while, switch to something else. Don't get stuck in patterns and maybe look at energetics of your food also. This is why it's best to balance out pieces of protein that say you're eating lamb or beef or whatever with a bunch of vegetables and a Mm -hmm. salad because now you have cooling foods, you have detoxifying foods, you have heavier foods that some people think have more toxins in it, but you need the benefits of it. So you're balanced that out with all these different Mm. things and now you have a complete meal. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great information for people to think about. Also, for me, when I think about how you formulate with with the vast experience that you have in herbology, particularly the adaptogenic herbs, that's also a really important distinction between um, something that just is known to have this particular effect because this particular chemical component versus looking at the synergy of how herbs work together and using them for a particular purpose. Right. You know, here's a great example. I just thought of this because I always wonder about this myself. There's a lot of research that's come out on ginger being good for arthritis. Arthritis is a heat condition, right? It's a localized heat. According to traditional Chinese medicine. An inflamed area of your body. Ginger itself makes you hotter and warmer. Mm. So just taking ginger, in my opinion, would probably aggravate your arthritis. But the research that's done on ginger, and this is a point that most people miss, is on a chemical that's extracted from Mm. ginger and put into a different form. And then that's been known to be highly anti-inflammatory. That's different than eating ginger the herb. Uh So you have to make this distinction when you're buying things and when you're trying things. Mm -hmm. Because there probably isn't enough of that one chemical if you just took ginger root and ginger capsules of just, you know, baked dried ginger to make any difference on your arthritis, and it might aggravate it. Whereas the isolated chemical might get rid of some inflammatory properties in your system and work a different way. Yeah, that also, it kind of makes me think of our yogi tea recipe, right? That that I make for my yoga classes where we're putting in spices and herbs that traditionally are thought of as being warming, clove, cinnamon, anise, um, ginger, right? These are kind of warming 
spices and herbs, but we make them for yogi tea, and that's drunk. That's chai. That's what chai is, right? right? And that is used in hot climates, such as India. Because people will break into a sweat and cool off. But it's also healing for the, the digestion because it does have, even though it's warming, this anti-inflammatory uh, property, yeah? Yeah. Chai tea is very good for your digestion. The problem with it in America is that they always sell it with tons of sugar in it, oh, which yeah. ruins your digestion. So the, if it was drank the way it's supposed to be, it has a slightly cooling or a slightly warming and detoxing effect on your digestive system. It's a great tea. Well, maybe I should include my recipe when we post up this podcast. <laughs> All right. This has been a great time talking about the energetics of herbs and food. A very interesting introduction. Anything else you'd like to say about it, Mr. Drummer? No, just be aware. Try things. You know, just be open to uh, the whole world of herbs and foods. I mean, it's there's so much out there to try and to experience. And, and I'm hoping this just kind of piques your interest in your awareness about food great well this is laura shakti and roger drummer thanks for listening to the herb works podcast and if you want more information go to herbworks.com 